Sock. But now you're a fool with spirit, Dan. And that's a very big difference. You still have a faint chance of finding the gate and passing through. Gate? When Socrates talked, it sounded like a pronouncement. Dan, we've talked much. You've seen visions and learned lessons. A teacher way of life, a way of action. It's time you became fully responsible for your own behavior. To find the gate, you must first learn to follow. Dot. The house rules. I volunteered. He laughed. Then the bell clanged as the car rolled smoothly through rain bundle into the station. I watched through the misty window as Socrates walked quickly out into the drizzle, wearing his poncho. I could see him put the gas nozzle in, go around to the driver's side, and say something to a bearded, blonde-haired man in the car. The window misted over again, so I wiped it clean with my sleeve in time to see them laughing. Then Socrates opened the door to the office and a draft of cold air slapped me harshly, bringing with it my first awareness, that I didn't feel well at all. Socrates was about to make some tea, when I said please, sit down, Sock, I'll make tea. He sat, nodding his head in approval. I leaned against the desk, feeling dizzy. My throat was sore, perhaps the tea would help. As I filled the kettle, and placed it on the hot plate, I asked, do I have to build some kind of road to this gate, then, Yes, in a sense, everyone must. You pave the way with your own work. Anticipating my next question, he said, anyone, any human being, male or female, has within, the capacity to find the gate and pass through, but very few are moved to do so, few are interested. This is very important. I didn't decide to teach you, because of any inherent capacity you possessed, as a matter of fact, you have glaring weaknesses along with your strong points but you have the will to make this journey. That stuck a resonant chord. I guess you could compare it to gymnastics, Sock. Even someone who is overweight, weak, or inflexible can become a fine gymnast, but the preparation is longer, more difficult. Yes, that's exactly what it's like. And I can tell you this. Your path is going to be very steep. My head felt feverish, and I started to ache all over. I leaned against the desk again, and out of the corner of my saw Socrates come toward me, reaching out for my head. Oh no, not now, I am not up to it, I thought. But he was only feeling my feverish forehead. Then he checked the glands in my neck, looked at my face and eyes, and felt my pulse for a long time. Dan, your energies are way out of balance. Your spleen is probably swollen. Suggest you visit a physician, tonight, now. I was feeling really miserable by the time I limped to Carroll Hospital. My throat was burning, my body aching. The doctor confirmed Sock's diagnosis. My spleen was badly swollen. I had a severe case of mononucleosis and was admitted to the infirmary. During that first fitful, feverish night, I dreamed that I had one huge leg and one shriveled one. When I tried to swing on the bars or tumble, everything was crooked, and I fell, fell fell into the late afternoon of the next day, when Socrates walked in with a bouquet of dried flowers. Socrates, said weakly, delighted by his unexpected visit, you shouldn't have. Yes I should have, he replied. I'll have the nurse put them in a vase. I'll think of you, when I look at them, I grinned weakly. They're not to look at, they're to eat, he said, leaving the room. A few minutes later, he returned with a glass of hot water, crushing some of the flowers. He wrapped them in a piece of cheese cloth he'd brought, and dipped the tea bag into the water. This tea will strengthen you, and help cleanse the blood. Here, drink. It tasted bitter, strong medicine. Then he took a small bottle of yellow liquid in which were floating more crashed herbs, and massaged the liquid deep into my right leg, directly over the scar. I wondered what the nurse, a very pretty, business-like young woman, would say if she came in. What is that yellow stuff in the bottle, Sock? Urine, with a few herbs. Urine, said, pulling my leg away from him with disgust. Don't be silly, he said, grabbing my leg and pulling it back. Urine is a very respected elixir in the ancient healing traditions. I closed my tired, aching eyes. My head was throbbing like jungle drums. I felt the fever starting to rise again. Socrates put his hand against my head then felt the pulse in my wrist. Good, the herbs are taking effect. Tonight should be the crisis. Tomorrow, you'll feel better. 
I managed a barely audible, thank you, Doc Sock. He reached over and put his hand on my solar plexus. Almost immediately, everything in my body intensified. I thought my head would explode. The fever started to burn me up, my glands pulsated. Worst of all was a terrible burning pain in my right leg at the sight of the injury. Stop it Socrates, stop it. I yelled. I just introduced a little more energy into your body than you are used to, he explained. It will accelerate the healing processes. It burns only where you have knots. If you were free of obstructions your mind was clear, your heart open, and your body free of tension, you'd experience the energy as an indescribable pleasure. Better than sex. You'd think you were in heaven, and in a way, you'd be right. Sometimes you scare me, Socrates. Superior people are always held in fear and awe, he grinned. In some ways you are superior too, Dan, at least on the outside. You look like a warrior, slim, supple, and strong from your rudimentary preparation in gymnastics. But you have a lot of work to do before you earn the kind of health I enjoy. I was too weak to argue. The nurse walked in. Time to take your temperature, Mr. Millman. Socrates had risen politely when she entered. I lay in bed looking pale and miserable. The contrast between the two of us had never felt greater than at that moment. The nurse smiled at Socrates, who grinned back. I think your son is going to be just fine with a little rest, she said. Just what I was telling him, Sock said, his eyes twinkling. She smiled at him again with the flirtatious look she gave him. With a rustle of white, she walked out of the room, looking blatantly appealing. Socrates sighed. There's something about a woman in uniform. Then he put his hand on my forehead. I fell into a deep sleep. The next morning, I felt like a new man. The doctor's eyebrows rose as he checked my spleen, felt for my swollen glands, and rechecked my chart. He was dumbfounded. I can't find anything wrong with you, Mr. Millman. He sounded almost apologetic. You can go home after lunch, up, get plenty of rest. He walked out staring at my chart. The nurse rustled by again. Help. I yelled, yes, she said, stepping inside. I can't understand it, nurse. I think I'm having heart trouble. Every time you go by, my pulse gets erotic. Don't you mean erratic, she said, oh, whatever. Smiling at me, she said, it sounds like you're ready to go home. That's what everyone keeps telling me, but you're all mistaken. I'm sure I'll need private nursing care. Smiling invitingly, she turned and walked away. Nurse, don't leave me, I cried. That afternoon, walking home, I was astonished by the improvement in my leg. I still limped badly, throwing my hip out to the side, whenever I took a step, but I could almost walk without my cane. Maybe there was something to Sock's magic urine treatment, or the battery charge he had given me. School had begun, and I was again surrounded by other students and books and assignments, but that was all secondary to me now. I could play the game without concern. I had much more important things to do in a small gas station west of campus. After a long nap, I walked to the station. The moment I sat down, Sock said, Lots of work to do. What is it? Said, stretching and yawning. A complete overhaul. Oh, a big job especially big. We're going to overhaul you.